I've just asked top international garden designer Paul Bangay for his best advice if you want to revamp your garden. For example, what's the most important thing that you need to think about? And what do you need to think about in terms of future-proofing your hard landscaping? How is garden design changing? And we're talking about his new book, Paul Bangay, A Life in Garden Design. And there are some lovely ideas from Paul's own garden, Stonefields. It's a much more perfect garden than mine will ever be, but it's so interesting to see the way he uses clipped shapes, very simple clipped shapes, repeatedly to create a massive impact. I also think you should look at how the herbaceous border is very definitely a herbaceous border. It's got strong colours and yet it echoes the soft muted greys of the landscape behind it. And best of all, look at how he uses garden rooms and there's always a path and a vista and just the sense that there's something interesting just around the corner. It's Alexandra here from the Middle Sized Garden YouTube channel and blog. And Paul's Garden Stonefields is in Australia, in the southern part, where the weather is quite similar to the climate in the south of the UK, although the summers are hotter. So it roughly equates to a USDA zone of nine. But of course, garden design principles are the same wherever you are in the world. And Paul's palette of plants is very much the one that we all use in temperate gardens everywhere. So generally, in terms of garden design, what would you say is the kind of number one piece of advice you'd give to anyone sitting there looking at their garden thinking, I need to change this. Be bold. I always say, you know, drama's great in the garden. Think of drama, but be bold, overscale things. Don't underscale things. I think, you know, novices and home gardeners tend to get the scale wrong. I think that's the difference between a professional and a, and a non-professional. We're, we're taught about scale and we learn about scale. If you're not sure, just make something slightly bigger than what you think it should be. Like make it slightly bigger, make the garden beds deeper. You know, less lawn, deeper garden beds. You know, if you're thinking of a pot, make it slightly bigger than what it should be. You know, a whole lot of little pots is not as effective as a group of, of, of larger pots. Also, you're very well known for a classical, very clipped, very yeah. tailored approach, which yeah. is very smart. You've been talking about going a bit softer. Yes. Um, so tell me a bit more about that. So this book is, is about my journey in garden design. And I started in the 1980s. You know, when things were f formal, think of, you know, Rosemary Vieri in the UK. And we, we were very influenced in Australia, particularly about in, from English gardens and English garden designers. So formality was everything back then. That's what my formative years were, you know, creating gardens that were very formal. I still love formal layouts. I just think a formal layout always works. For my mind, a classical layout lasts forever. It seems to be timeless. But we're getting rid of a lot of the hedging. You know, the hedging is labour intensive. We've got the problems with all the box and now we're going softer. So cutting out the hedging so much and doing lots and lots of perennial planting. So I know that's popular in Europe, but it's particularly popular here. And it's great because a lot of the perennials are, are very hardy. They don't mind our cold winters. They don't mind our hot, dry summers. You know, a lot of them are doing really well and don't need much water. So softness is coming from, you know, lots and lots of diversity in, in perennial plantings and mass plantings of, of those perennials. And I think that, you know, what inspires garden designers to, to keep evolving. I think that, uh, you know, evolving is very important. I've been going for 40 years. You can't do the same look. If I was doing the same super formal gardens I was doing back in the 1980s, I probably would, wouldn't be working as much as I am today. So, you know, inspiration, what inspires you to keep creating different looks. And a big part of that is travel. So, you know, there's a big chapter in there on, you know, me visiting gardens that have similar climates to Australia. So Iran, Syria, Jordan, you know, parts of Italy, Greece, you know, going to visit those places and seeing how if those really ancient civilizations used to garden in very hot, dry climates was, was very inspirational for me. So, you know, and, and books that, that influenced me, magazines that influenced me, podcasts like yours or, you know, so it, I think inspiration is a big part of the book and, and mentors, you know, there's a lot of mentors in, in there that were very important to me as I was growing up. David Hicks, for instance, uh, you know, your great designer, was became a very close friend. And he was just hugely inspirational to me. And talking about these mentors and how they influenced a young designer. So there's, there's, there's lots more in there than just gardens. Yes, there is. No, it's yeah. a really readable book, actually. I really enjoyed oh, it. Yeah. And one of the things about the garden here is it's yeah. divided into garden rooms. Yes. 
Now, what would you advise people if they're thinking about dividing, well, even with a much smaller garden? You know, the middle-sized garden is sort of under an acre, but yeah. you know, you could have someone with a long, thin garden in the town. What would you say about dividing into rooms? What I just think it creates a more interesting garden. Like, if you can see the whole garden in one gla glance, it tends to, you know, the, you, you get that view, it's all over and done with in no time. But if there's areas that your eye is led on to, then you, that process of discovery and enticement is what creates interest and drama in a garden. So, you know, even if you've got a quarter acre or, or half an acre, you know, just don't divide into too many rooms, but just create spaces that you can't see all at the one time. And then, you know, maybe even it's just a curved path that's winding through lovely deep beds of perennials, and you know that path's taking you somewhere, but you can't see where it's taking you. That's really interesting. And that's what people love, you know, looking at and seeing in, seeing in the garden. So, you know, I think that the garden room principle still holds up to this to these to this day. Here here at Stonefields, ours was largely driven as a response to environment. So we're sitting on top of a hill, you get this lovely view down the valley, and it's windy. It's just really, really windy. And so, you know, I, I wanted to create a, the effect of a wall garden so we were protected from the wind. I couldn't aff afford to do walls at the time I created it, so we, we unfortunately put hedges in, which was a total false sense of, of economy because we could have paid off those walls so long ago in the clip, the clipping of the he of the hedges. But you know the walls, so the walls and creating the the rooms within there really was to protect the garden from from the wind. In your new book, you end with looking into the future of garden design. Yes. And what you say is that you want it to be a very resilient garden. Yes. Now, can you tell us what that means to us in our gardens and how you're going to deal with it in design terms? Well, I think, you know, when we're talking about resilience in gardens, we're really largely talking about the effect climate change has on gardens. And all gardeners will know that we've seen the effects of climate change already, especially here in Australia where we, we can go months without rain and it seems to be getting hotter and drier. The UK seems to be getting sort of wetter in some times and drier in other times. So the sort of fluctuation is sort of hard to manage. So I think that, you know, making a garden more resilient for me is always looking to plants that are more native to the area, so more endemic to the area, that, that always helps. Drought resistant plants and, you know, j just being aware of what the surrounding landscape I is requiring of you, you know. Don't pave over whole areas, you know, allow for drainage, allow for water to seep into the ground. Using plants that don't need so much water. Um, just being conscious of, of the environment and how that envir environment is changing. But for, you know, for the, the gardens we do in Australia, it really is incorporating a lot more Australian native plants. You know, that's been the big movement here and it's been a really great movement. And you work in both the States and in Britain yes. and all over the world, yeah. basically. So how do you approach the native plants issue in different countries. Well, it's kind of funny because you know you go, I go to England and we've got a little house in England, so we're getting to, to know the plant material there a lot more. But plants that we would say are exotic in Australia, like oaks and elms and and those species, are endemic to to, to England. So you know, <laughs> I would call them exotic in, in England. So you know, it's it's just learning what is is native to that area, and that I find you 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 can learn by visiting nurseries visiting the botanical gardens. I think the botanical gardens are always a great resource. And just look, just driving around and seeing what's growing in the forests, you know, in the local forests around there. And that'll teach you what will do well in that area. And in terms of hard landscaping and yeah. resilience, yeah. what are you sort of moving towards and what are you moving away from? We're, I mean, we, we, we are moving away from lots of paving. Like, you know, it used to be that Paving was, was really sort of easy to do and sort of durable. You know, you could do a lot of things on it. You could set a lot of furniture up on it. You could have play on it. But now we're using a lot more pervious material. So that might be gravels, you know, creating gardens within gravel areas. Ground covers as opposed to lawn. So it's not so intensive in terms of chemicals and mowing all the time. And just thinking about how the water moves through the garden. Like, you know, obviously a lot of hard landscaping, it just channels water into drains. That's what we're trying to avoid. And when you say ground covers, could you give us a few suggestions for some good ground covers that aren't lawns? We're experimenting with this a lot because the big question is, lawns have been such a great feature of gardens for so long. If you have kids, they're just such wonderful areas to play on, aren't they? So we're, we're using a lot of dichondras. They're, they're, they're proving quite tough in terms of traffic movement on top of them. And we've got a native violet in Australia called Violet Viola heteracy that's proving to be quite tough. Zoysia, the grass zoysia, I don't know whether that grows in the UK, it might be slightly too cold for zoysias. Yeah. But zoysias are a great grass, 
don't need mowing and take a lot of wear and tear. So in fact, what, what you might say is that if you go to your native grasses yeah. anywhere, yeah. then that's going to mean less care, yes. isn't it? But yeah. I mean, we, I mean, a lot of the native grasses are too big to walk on, so you've got to you've got to be careful what you what you actually plant. I mean, the zoysia it still stays quite low. I think it's a Japanese grass, in, in fact, but it, it doesn't need much water and it doesn't need mowing, and it's just great and it gives you that sort of lumpy, bumpy, sort of softer feeling to the to the lawn space. And what about things like chamomile and herbs, or is it they just don't tread on well? They just don't tread on well, and they tend to, like chamomile tends to, you know, gets too wet, it rots out, it doesn't winter, overwinter very well. So, you know, thyme, we, we, we are using a lot of thyme, like the little thymus cephalum is, is working out quite well. But again, if you walk on that too much, it does tend to wear out. And what about moss lawns? Well, moss lawns in Australia don't work because we're just too hot and too dry here. But, you know, you've got shady spots, and damp spots in the UK and parts of America, it works extremely well. And in terms of the actual hard landscaping materials, yeah. what would you advise people to sort of look at and what would you advise them to steer away from? Well, again, if we're talking about resilience and sustainability, we don't want to be importing materials from overseas. So look to your local stone materials. I mean, you know, our little house in the Cotswolds, we use our local Cotswold stone, it's fantastic. It comes from two miles down the road. And I think that's extremely sustainable. You know, in Australia, we've been great culprits of importing everything from China. It's relatively close to us, but you know, it's, there's a lot of miles, there's a lot of carbon miles in importing stone from China, sadly. At one stage, it was a terrible indictment, but we were cutting our sandstone, which is one of the great materials of Australia. Look, the whole of Sydney's made from sandstone, as is Tasmania. And we were sending blocks of the sandstone to China to be cut into pavers and then brought back again because it was cheaper to do it in China. Well, it's just bad, so bad for the environment. So, you know, look, look to what is, is local in your area. I, you know, local stones are the, are the things we, we tend to be using or gravels from our area. Um, brick, do you use much brick? We don't use much brick. It's coming back into fashion. You know, it was really quite popular here in the 70s and 80s and then went totally out of fashion, but it's coming totally back into fashion again. Recycled bricks, I think, are a really great sustainable material. And what about wood? Well, wood, we, a lot of timber decking is used. It tends to rot out, tends to need a lot of maintenance. We are, and I, I hate to say this, but we are looking at a lot of recycled plastic mod wood, we call it here, which is very durable, lasts forever, and it's made from recycled plastic, so it tends to be a great thing. I'm not a fan of fake materials, like fake grass or fake wood, but this is actually a very good product. So if you'd like to find out more about Paul Bangay, a life in garden design, there's a link in the description below. And thank you for watching.